All right, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. I'd like to thank all these wonderful women that are standing behind me doing all kinds of things from business to advocacy work to moms, uh, so many ways impacting our great state. Today we're celebrating 100 years since the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. I am Pamela Abbott. I am the second female lieutenant governor in the state of South Carolina and the first Republican female lieutenant governor in the state. I'm a former CEO and president of Quality Business Solutions, so changed my role in life around a great bit. I'm honored to be here today with all these wonderful women, with our first lady, Peggy McMaster. Hey, Peggy. Peggy does so many great things for our state making sure that our mansion is kept um, in the loving, pristine state that we have always seen it. But she also is a huge advocate for women and children that are being trafficked, not only in our state, but in our nation, bringing in public speakers and lending a voice and a face to this amazing mission that she takes on. I'm so very proud to have next to me my daughter, Amanda. It is so important because the women that came before us made it possible for us to be here today. And we are supposed to be setting the example so women ahead of us can go and continue to do the same great work. In South Carolina, we should be very proud. We have shattered the glass ceiling, being fourth in the nation for women-owned businesses, impacting our economy by a whopping $15.7 billion annually. That's right, we should, should definitely applaud that. You know, when I looked up suffrage to find out facts and kind of see the history of it, you know, I noticed at the very top of the search list was Europe. Women in England who marched and fought for their place in society and for the right to vote. And then came along the US. After us, other countries followed suit. Spain in 1931, France in 1944, Belgium, Italy, Romania, and Yugoslavia in 1946. Later still was Switzerland in 1971, and Liechtenstein in 1984. In Latin America, National suffrage was granted to women between 1929 in Ecuador and 1946 in Argentina. Saudi Arabia did not grant women the right to vote until 2015. We still have a lot of work to do, ladies, because there are still countries that women technically are not allowed to vote. Countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Uganda, Kenya, Oman, and Egypt have significant barriers for women. Women are treated with protests and violence at polling areas and voting booths. So we have a lot to do. I see the Girl Scouts of America is represented here today, and thank you for what you do. You definitely give a path forward to our young girls trying to make a mark in life. Again, thank you all for being here, and I will close it out uh, with a proclamation for, with our, from our governor at the end. I'm Holly Ulbrich, co-president of the League of Women Voters of South Carolina. Our 1,200 members are in 13 communities and serve more than half of our 46 counties. I'm wearing this sash today in honor of my great-grandmother, Alice Munger Stewart, who marched for women's suffrage in the early 1900s and got to vote in 1920, 24, and 28, and passed that passion on to me. I've always thought of August as the month with no holidays, and then one day, about 10 years ago, I went, what are you thinking? Women's Equality Day. The 26th of August, the date on which the, the 19th Amendment was ratified and gave, say it right, suffragists, not suffragettes. It didn't give, but that's when the suffragists won the right and privilege of voting. And then they immediately responded with, 
oh, what do we do next? So in that same year of 1920, the League of Women Voters of the United States and the League of Women Voters of South Carolina were born and began to work helping people to vote, to register, to figure out what a ballot was, to find their polling place, to figure out who the candidates were and what, they, what kind of office they were running for, to study the issues. We are deeply nonpartisan. That's why I broke the rule and instead of wearing white, I wore purple because it's a blend of red and blue. <laughs> We are nonpartisan. We do not support or oppose candidates or parties. We do, however, as many in the legislature know, take positions on issues and advocate and educate. But so much of our work is voter service. I can't tell you how many questions we get every day. When can I get an absentee ballot? What kind of excuse do I have to have? Where is my polling place? When do I have to send it back in? How do I register to vote? This is a, a, an essential part of our work, but we've also worked on campaign finance reform, supporting education, environmental protection, ethics legislation, constitutional revision. Over the, last, all, over the last 100 years in South Carolina, we're proud of our work. We're proud to partner with other organizations and with our elected officials in making democracy work and encouraging and supporting informed citizen participation in government. Thank you. Good morning, South Carolina. I greet you on behalf of Benedict College, one of South Carolina's oldest historically black colleges. I greet you as the 14th and first female president of an institution that was founded by a woman. I believe deeply that the women's right to vote is inextricably tied to the anti-slavery movement in this country. Women of color played a tremendous role in ensuring that all women would have the right to vote. Benedict's legacy, 150-year legacy, is replete with examples of women who have stood tall in the fight for equal rights and most assuredly in the fight for women's rights. Because women's rights are equal rights. Septima Clark, an alumna of Benedict College, in 1955, the mother of the civil rights movement, continued to plan, to prepare, to ensure voter registration drives, voter turnout, and to push women to exercise their right to the ballot. There is an African proverb that says, when a woman is in charge, rivers run uphill, rivers run up mountains. That means amazing things happen when women are in charge. Now that is not to suggest that our male counterparts are not phenomenal. They simply need our support. They need our, our assistance. When women vote, elections are changed. When women stand tall, positive things happen. When women do well, communities do well. When women stand tall, South Carolina stands tall. It is a great day to be a South Carolina resident. It is a great day to celebrate 100 years at the ballot. It is a great day to acknowledge and proclaim, I will vote. I know that you will too. To God be the glory for the right to vote. Happy 100th birthday for women's suffrage. Well, good morning. I'm Elizabeth Davis, president of Furman University. Mrs. McMaster, Lieutenant Governor Evett, distinguished legislators, panelists, and guests, it's truly an honor to join you today as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Obtaining the vote was important because it gave more power to women's civic participation and to the causes women supported. It served as a platform upon which women have propelled themselves ever since into positions of leadership in our communities, our businesses, our universities, and in our government at all levels. Amazing women paved the way for the rest of us, and it's up to us to continue progress. In my field, higher education, we still have a lot of work to do. Women comprise a little more than half of all student bodies across the country, yet only 30% of college and university presidents are women. With this in mind, I'm proud to be a member of the American Council on Education's Women's Network Executive Committee. We're working to advance women in higher education, helping to improve and remove systemic barriers, especially on the pathway to the presidency. 
I was the first female provost at Baylor University and the first woman to lead Furman. When asked what it's like to be first, I typically respond with, it's great, because that implies there will be more. I didn't realize what an impact it was being the first female leader in a role until I was leaving Baylor to come to Furman. Many women shared with me that I was a source of encouragement and hope just by holding the position. Being such a role model is a tremendous responsibility and one that I don't take lightly. If not for the many champions in my career and over the past 100 years, I wouldn't be in my current role. And it's not just women who have paved the way. I was appointed by men or groups of mostly men to every leadership role that I've had. While I'm the first woman to lead Furman, other women have had a major impact on Furman's history. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, Mary Camilla Judson, a suffrage supporter, was the principal of the Greenville Women's College, which eventually merged with Furman University. A discreet feminist, Judson's promotion of women was most explicitly displayed in the activities she introduced on campus, the public debates her students engaged in on contemporary topics, including suffrage, and the careers in which they embarked after graduation. On Wednesday of next week, Furman and Greenville will join other universities and communities around the nation in lighting buildings in the purple, gold, and white colors of the suffrage campaign a national effort known as Forward Into Light. Collectively, the success of the women's suffrage campaign represents the possibilities of what can happen when women and people come together to more fully immerse ourselves into the causes in which we believe. While we remain grateful and honor their legacy, particularly during this centennial month, we ought to allow their activism to inspire us to get involved and insert our voices into the public conversation in the hopes that we can make our communities and our inst institutions more just and more humane. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, uh, First Lady McMaster and Pamela Evett, our Lieutenant Governor, for having me today. Uh, women are born fighters. We fight for our families, we fight for our businesses, and we fight for our communities. Fighting for the right to vote was one of our first and most important fights. And that's why I'm proud to be here today to talk about the progress we've made and the work ahead of us. A hundred years ago, women's suffrage was enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, giving women a louder voice in the democratic process. As many of you know, South Carolina was slower than many other states to formally ratify the 19th Amendment. It took us another 50 years. One of the loudest voices for women's suffrage in South Carolina was Eulalie Sally. When the General Assembly and Governor McNair finally ratified the 19th Amendment in South Carolina, Sally said, well, boys, I've waited 50 years to tell you what I think about you for taking so long to pass this. And then I think of each of us that we can relate to what Miss Sally said back then. There are still obstacles each of us face along the road to equality. I'm encouraged that today little girls know that they can be CEOs, university presidents, board chairs, governors, senators, lieutenant governors, and they can run for president of the United States. But we still have work to do. As we celebrate 100 years of women voting, we should also remember to lift as we climb, empowering young women to pursue careers in businesses, the life sciences, and yes, in elected office. The only way we'll see more women serving in office is if more women run for the office and vote. Thank you again for having me today, and I too like to applaud all my firsts in universities, and I can say um, I'm often always the only woman in the room, and I'm proud to be the first woman CEO of our company. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the privilege of being able to speak today on women's suffrage movement and the years that it took for activists to win the right to vote. Today, we celebrate. We celebrate all those women. I celebrate them too. Thank you. 
Today we celebrate all those women who fought that we may have the right to vote and the power that we have today. I am the first black female to serve as South Carolina House of Representative from Marlboro County. My name is Patricia Moore Hennigan. The last female was in 18, black female was in, a black male was 1864. And so I am so proud to be here today. To understand history is to understand that something or somebody in history is calling us by our name to remind us of the great sacrifices and services that women rendered to make it possible for us to be where we are today. A real orator of the women rights movement was Sojourner Truth. In her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman? She delivered that speech at Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. It received worldwide publicity. And she continued to speak until she died on the rights of women during the, and after the civil rights. But the quote that I remember more about her, when she said, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, <laughs> these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right upside, uh, get it right side up. And now they are asking us to do something. Man, you better let us do it. <laughs> and then we have Clara Barton. She hated, she hated speeches, but she delivered a powerful message on women's suffrage when she said, I believe I must have been born believing in the full rights of women to all the privilege and position which nature and justice accord to us in common with other human beings, perfectly equal rights, human rights. And then we have Susan B. Anthony. There's a great story about how she lived on a hill and the women would come down, uh, uh, come down the valley to come to her house and they would aid her. And the story goes on to tell how that Susan would take care of the children and the other women would be making posters and costumes that they were going to wear during their marches. The theme here for me was women working together, equal power. And we must remember the agenda for women's rights included more than just the right to vote. Women wanted the right to jobs, job opportunities, fair wages, educational opportunities, equal, equality, equality, equality in marriage, economic security, and the right to serve any political office that we want to serve in. Amen. Women knew that the right to vote would give them the power, and they, because of that power, they could get more benefits. Now I want to share a few things with you about the women's suffrage movement. In 1868, a group of 172 black and white women went to the polls in New Jersey, provided their own ballots and they had their own boxes in order to cast their vote. And that year was the year for the national election. And guess what? It inspired others to demonstrate so that they could have their rights. And then in 1872, Susan B. Anthony led a group of 16 women to be registered and to vote in Rochester, New York. All were arrested, all 16. But Susan Anthony was the one they held. And they made her pay $100. Well, they thought they were. She refused to do it, and she didn't pay it. Thousands of women were in prison, believe it or not, and many were beaten because they just wanted their rights. And then on August the 16th, uh, August the 18th, 1920, the 19th Amendment of the Constitution was finally ratified that declared women had the rights, the rights and responsibility to be citizens, just like men. Women working together, we call that power. However, I would be remiss if I didn't point out this point, that it took 50 more years before African-American women could vote, 50 more years after ratification. You see, voting is power, however you want to look at it. That is why today 
we continue to have issues. Issues just as the right to voting by mail, removal of precincts from certain areas, waiting in line three to five hours, voting is power. And our executive director, I like that, thank you. <laughs> our executive director of the South County Election Commission, Marsha Andino, sent a letter to the Senate requesting that the Senate return as soon as possible to address the voting concerns related to the November election. She has taken a bold stand, a direct step, to ensure that everyone has the right to vote. Let me tell you some of the concerns that she had. She said we need to reinstate the, the state of emergency reason for absentee ballot, allow order absentee ballot online. She said we need to remove the witness requirement for absentee to return those envelopes, allow the use of drop box for absentee ballot, allow more time for officials to process absentee ballot, extend the date for which officials must certify the absentee ballot, and allow curbside voting at designated location. Voting is power, and I thank her for it. Now today, I am sure the women's suffrage group will be proud to see so many women today, so many of you here today, and see that so many of us are holding so many different offers in the state, in the national, as mayors, as councilmen, as college professors in their positions of, of authority, uh, as the president of Benedict College, all of these positions, vice president, president, uh, governor, whatever position that we want to hold. Because 100 years later, women are living up to the expectation of the women who came before us. Women working together is definitely power. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. First, I give honor to God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because without him, none of us would be here. I am Annie E. McDaniel, and I represent House District 41. I too am a first. I am the first female to be, <laughs> but she can't remember to take a mask off. <laughs> I'm the first female to be elected to House District 41 in the history of House District 41. And I'm also the first African American to be elected since Reconstruction, we had a male elected prior to. So I want to, thank, um, I want to thank Lieutenant Governor Pamela E. Everett and the staff and all for inviting me to this press conference and making it possible. The 19th Amendment, which guarantees all women the right to vote. However, we found out that all did not mean all. We learned that African-American women did not enjoy the voting rights until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the readoption and its strengthening in 1970, 1975, 1982. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that until 1969, which is after the ratification, African-Americans still had struggles with ease of voting. Obstacles such as poll taxes, exclusion from citizenship, and literacy tests limited their ability to freely vote. And not to mention, Jim Crow in the South made voting for women of color virtually impossible. Well, the path of women having the right to vote dates back to 1869, led by phenomenal women, as you heard earlier, as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady. As I focus on women in the suffrage parade, I just can visualize the suffrage movement and many strong women dressed in white marching for the right to vote. My sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, was the only organized group of black women that marched. And that organization was founded January 13, 1913. However, two months later, those 22 phenomenal women participated in that march. But again, during that march, they had to march at the back of the line. More than a century later, 2020, African American, women's powerful role as political organizers and committed voters is again, once again, 
in the spotlight as presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden has named a black woman, a member of Black Sorority Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Kamala Harris, as his running mate. That deserves an applause. <laughs> I know a few South Carolina, South Carolina women who render service in the public's interest. And they include, as you heard earlier, and her name keep coming up, Mary McLeod Bethune, whose portrait sits in the State House. Majesta Mateith Simpkins, whose um, portrait also sits in the State House. Jean Toll. Jean Toll was the first woman justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court. Matilda Evans the first black woman native of South Carolina to work in the state as a physician. And of course, Nikki Haley, our South Carolina governor. She was the first female governor and the first Indian American woman to serve as governor in the United States. <laughs> and of course, let us not forget our own Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett. And just to keep going down the line, but I'm just going to mention one more. Our South Carolina, um, I'm sorry, uh, Hillary Clinton, she broke the glass ceiling as the first female to run for president on a majority ticket. So as you all can see, women, we are phenomenal, and we make things happen. Just a few more notable facts. 100 United States senators, 23 of them are women. 435 House of Representatives, 101 of them are women. 46 South Carolina senators. Only four are women. 124 South Carolina House of Representatives. 24 are women. And only one female governor in the history of the state of South Carolina. So I heard someone ask, do we still have work to do? Of course we still have work to do. So I say to all of the women that are here, all of the women who are listening, all of the women of these United States of America. Stand tall, take the role. Do not be part of the menu, be at the table. Make sure that your voice is heard. Speak for those who do not have a voice. We wanna make sure that those issues that pertain to women are heard. Do you all know that this afternoon we will be signing, uh, the governor, <laughs> not me, we'll be signing the uh, lactation bill. It's 2020, did it take that long for that to happen? Of course it did. So we need women. We need women so that those um, individual uh, bills that pertain to women can be discussed, debated, and with the correct and proper number, they can be put into law. As I close on this 19th um, centennial of this 19th Amendment, which gives women the right to vote, I close and share just a little bit about my story. This little girl a poverty-raised little girl. She's not a victim of her circumstances, but of the success of her mother, who through her, mor her moral fortitude, instilled in her by God, made sure that her children were raised with all of the moral values that life could bring. I graduated the salutatorian of my class, first to graduate from college, only family member to hold elected office, served successfully as a member of my hometown school board for 18 years, never losing an election. I am the first, as I stated earlier, African-American female representative to serve in the House of Representatives for House District 41. In closing, I would like to say to you, as I stated earlier, and I'm gonna reiterate it because I wanna make sure you all hear it. If you are not at the table, you become the menu. South Carolina women, do not be absent from the table. Do not be a part of the menu. Take your seat at the table. Women, stay encouraged. Be the change that you want others to be. Lift your voices. So as we read in history, you can be phenomenal as those, as those great women during the suffrage march of 1913. Vote, run for office, lead. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to all of our speakers very, very well, uh, giving us that bit of history about women in our country. You know, history is so very important because if we don't know where we came from, we don't know how far we've come. 
And so uh, I share with you the pride in being uh, a woman, being at the table, being able to make decisions, being able to make a difference. So now our call to action. Ladies, inspire, encourage, encourage our young ones. Thank you again to the Girl Scouts for being here. Let them know that there is no mountain too high to climb and no dream too big to dream. Encourage, encourage the ladies you work for. Make sure that we are pulling them up with us. As Lou Kennedy said, it's lonely at the top. Make sure you leave a ladder and a roadmap for everybody else to get there. And vote, make sure our ladies know in South Carolina that your vote counts. Whether you're the president of a company, the lieutenant governor, a first lady, or a mom, everybody has a vote. It equalizes everyone. So let's make sure we are all registered. Uh, one thing that's very important, goes hand in hand with voting, is our census. Our census deadline has moved up to September 30th. Ladies, we know we get things done in our households. Make sure if that census data has not been turned in that we do it. It helps. It helps our elders. It helps our children. It helps programs. It helps for broadband. It's all the things that we come to Columbia to fight for. You can do that and make that impact in your home. It all starts with one. So, I have a message from our amazing governor. He has a proclamation. The proclamation states, whereas the bold, courageous, and powerful women who fought for the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution on August 18, 1920, deserve special celebration by the Palmetto State, especially on the 100th anniversary of its ratification in 2020. And whereas South Carolina holds a special place in women's suffrage history, as thousands of women throughout the state advocated in the streets, in the newspapers, in the state capitol, and even in the skies, distributing suffrage pamphlets from one of the state's first airplanes for these rights. And whereas the fact that women today are active in local, state, and national government and are running for office in unprecedented numbers reminds us that we all follow in the footsteps of these resolved American suffragists. And whereas the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution has played an important role in advancing the rights of all women. Now, therefore, I, Henry McMaster, governor of the great state of South Carolina, do hereby proclaim August 18th, 2020, as the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution's 100th anniversary day throughout the state and encourage all South Carolinians to recognize the significance of this ratification of the 19th Amendment to promoting the core values of and participation in our democracy. Thank you all so much for coming today and thank you so much for all you're yet to do.